Welcome to Leave No Doubt. I've been joined by Matt Ritchie. Matty, firstly, thank you for joining me uh, on the podcast. How are you doing? My pleasure, parts. Very well, thanks, mate. You? Yeah, good, good. Um, to get us started, mate, I obviously know you well, and, and to give people a slight bit of context, we grew up with each other since, I think, five, six years old, played with each other, uh, you know, until we was uh, 15, 16 years old. So your passion for the game, when we were growing up, you just had this, like, incredible love and enthusiasm for football. Um, it's something that I really speak to a lot of people that it is, it's certainly noticeable with you. Um, how important do you think it is for guys to have a huge sense of enthusiasm about a game if they want to ultimately become successful? Yeah, um, that was just something that naturally came to me. I had, uh, had an older brother, played football, uh, grew up with a ball. Um, but yeah, I think that you, you certainly from a young age, I think, um, having my own kids now, my little man's not too bothered about football. Um, and it's one of those, you can't really push him to love it. Um, he's got to want to play. If he, if he wants to play, he, he needs to want it. Um, and I always did as a kid. Um, it was my, I wasn't the most academic, academic kid in the world. So I think it was a, it was a, it was a game and a, and a sport that I could express myself at. And, um, um, at a young age, I was, I was probably told that I, I had a I had a bit of a, a ability, and and I just I used that as a as a motivation to to keep improving, and and went from there, really, mate. But see, like a lot of young guys, obviously love football. It, it's around us all the time. You can get immersed in it by seeing what you know the guys on the television and stuff. But back when we were young, there was no social media, there was no YouTube videos like you very rarely saw football on the telly and you like I'm, I feel like I loved football when I was a kid but not as much as as you did like you, <laughs> it was just insane mate every training session every match day like you were uh, you know head and shoulders not just like an ability we'll talk about that later but talking about your enthusiasm like what what do you think it was about you that, or what do you think it is about football that you ended up just loving so much Honest, honestly I can't put my finger on one thing um but I, I remember, I remember even to to this day, people people say this guy's mad. Um, we'll finish training. I want to play tech ball. I'll be the last one on the pitch. Can we do this? Can we do finishing or whatever? Um, it's just how I've always been, and I suppose that that's the. I would say that's probably one of the, my biggest strengths that I love the game and I'm willing to go above and beyond to to try and be successful within it. So um, I just continue to do that. I know that it's a positive thing. Um, and I've probably learned that the, this is the sort of thing that um, can can keep you in a team or uh, set examples for others. Um, it's just it was just always there. I, I, used, I remember used to walk to school. Um, I'd take a ball to school, and I'd I genuinely want to walk to school on my own rather than meet my mates at the shop because it allowed me to take a ball. And I used to walk down Privet Road, Oval Gardens, and. Um, uh, into Bay House and I used to kick the ball against all the walls on the way there left and right foot and that was just my, my, my walk to school I absolutely loved it See when uh, even when we was first in teammates in Bournemouth like there was a I think probably about a two month period where after training every day and after the extras after training they had we just I'm going to plug the facilities that we're sat in now sat in a change room at, at Stoneham Lane Complex Hampshire FA um, so thank you to the guys obviously for for allowing us to use their facilities, but we've just walked past a bounce board, like a you know a big like netted netted bounce board, and after training every single day, you would get on me to stay out and play two touch against this board. We'd just play for about thirty minutes an hour, and I was ready to go in. I thought I'd done enough, and you ne you never allowed me to uh, to to go in without playing. The reason why I talk about that is because you've never allowed other people's perceptions of. You know, it can be seen as bit. People who watch this podcast will understand the word busy, and it's been spoken about before. And all these extras and that enthusiasm, you never allowed anybody else to make you feel like that was a bad thing. No, um, I don't know where that really came from. As I say, it was just a, a habit, a, a habit that I was always, I always had a ball. Any, anyone that knew me as a kid would say he always had a ball with him. However big it was, it might have been a tennis ball, whatever it was, it was a ball. And I might have been throwing it wherever, I don't know. But uh, that was just how I always was. And um, it was encouraged. Uh, Sean North was my youth team coach. And he was the same. He used to encourage us, um, always, always have a ball with you. And 
small rep- repetition of things and play against the wall. And my dad was the same. My dad used to say, go and, go and play against the wall in the drive or whatever. And that's what we did. Um, but yeah, the training, I mean, I remember I remember the days parts, I've got to be honest. I remember it clearly where it was on the pitch and everything. Um, but I loved it. It was like, a, it, I think at the time, it was like a new toy for us at the training ground. It was a big black net in a sort of a, a spring frame. And like you say, I remember you used to fire it in at the bottom and it would ping up and it tested your reactions, your touch, everything. And for me, it was like, what were we, 20, 24 so maybe? mid-20s, yeah. Mid-20s, early 20s. Like, where else are you going to go? I didn't, I didn't like gaming. I didn't like uh, drinking or anything like that. Um, my only focus was football, 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 and how can I reach my goals and, and, and try and play at the highest level I possibly can. And I knew that practice was all I knew, really. Keep practicing, keep working hard. Um, and it was just something that I loved. And like you say, it, it, sometimes it may have been too much. Um, I, I picked up a few injuries, actually, probably through o- over overworking. And, but it was, uh, I just loved it. I loved football. We're going to get more into that, mate, in a, a sort of an overriding theme of your career. But um, I'm interested to talk to you a little bit more about those early days because uh, I've, you know, I watched these podcasts back, and one of the conversations I had with Wiltshire, not just to, to sort of plug a, a big player's name, but uh, I asked him about his talent as a young player. The reason why I bring that up to you is because obviously I was around you during that time, and although I was quite a talented young kid, like you were still within the talented, the best of the talented. Um, the question I asked him was, do you think you're born with talent or do you think you learn to be talented? Um, and I'm asking you this because you practiced every day, your way to school, in training, match days. Like It was never a time you just told us that, that you rarely had a, didn't have a ball. Do you think you were the perfect combination of talent and hard work or do you think you're born with talent or you can learn to be talented? Welcome to the Leave No Doubt podcast. I'm so excited to welcome our new sponsors, Connection Technologies, a market leader in business-to-business tools ranging from business mobile, hosted telephony, and fixed line services. Head over to their website at www.connection-technologies.co.uk, fill in their inquiry web form and find out how Connection Technologies can support your business moving forward. Um, it's a really good question, Bart. <laughs> uh, I think I think you have to have a certain level of ability, but for sure, you, you it's for me the higher you go, it's about finding a way because ultimately, there's not too many players that have everything. Maybe Kevin De Bruyne, he's got the lot, um, but the higher you go, it's about finding a way and um, nailing down one skill maybe that that you've that you're good at. And making that your your masterpiece, and then trying to build blocks around that so that you can you can execute it within games. And um, through my career, I developed. It was always said he's got a powerful left foot as a young boy, um, and I just stuck to that. I was like, keep shooting my left foot. Everyone says it's it's a rocket. Keep shooting with it, and that's what I did. And and then all of a sudden, crossing, I put a few good balls in it. I remember being at Notts County on loan and scored a few goals and this guy could shoot from anywhere. He scores goals from everywhere. Um, so just listening to probably what people told me was good, I just continued to try and do. If someone's told me that's good, I'm going to continue to try and do that. And um, that, that, That's what i always done. I always just uh, try to improve areas that weren't so good as well. As you are when you're young, mate, my, obviously my parents and, and your parents were friends and... I never felt like like if, if I speak to my parents about my youth football now, like they they wouldn't say that they were pushy parents, and and they'd agree that your parents weren't weren't pushy parents. But a lot of parents these days are, and they they put a lot of pressure on their children to to be successful at football, to practice, and and to play well, um, which some people can or cannot deal with. But you never had that drive from your your parents. It wasn't them that that were pushing you when you were young. How did you, you know, we talked about your enthusiasm and, and we will continue to, but that level of passion that you had for football didn't come from your parents. You weren't being pushed. So what do you think it was about you that wanted to practice, that wanted to work hard? Uh, 
first of all, it's just my love of football. I think, obviously, I remember being um, probably the feeling of, of uh, recognition or um, praise. Everyone, everyone's human. We all love that that feeling when someone says "well done" or pat you on the back, and you made the difference today, son. And from a young age, that's how it was. Uh, I remember playing for Gosport Borough. I was, I think, I'd just turned six, maybe or five, at Moncton, and Dave Hurst did the presentation after the tournament. We won two one or three one in, in the final. I was really young. Dave Hurst, the Portsmouth Academy manager at the time, did the um, presentation, and he done like a little speech about me, and he said. Uh, in many years, I think I'll see this boy at, at, at Portsmouth first team level, and I remember that to this day. And that that feeling as a as a young kid, even of course, you're the one being singled out for being excellent. Um, it's a nice feeling. So probably that was probably the thing that drove me. The the feeling of at the time I didn't know it, but the feeling of recognition and 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 as I say, high praise. It's a it's a it's human nature, I suppose. So see, like you would train almost every night, match days on the weekend. Your parents were obviously willing to to take you there and drive you there. Um, did they like? They didn't expect anything from you, I'd imagine. But what, when did football become like? You obviously love the game, and you're talking about proper childhood here, like sort of like younger than twelve years old. But at the age of fourteen, fifteen, where that you start to have the pressure of scholarships after school and stuff. And, you, you know, we both know that you were never going to go into university and, and be a scientist. That just <laughs> wasn't your path. Um, but when did you turn this love and this passion, enthusiasm into a serious ambition to become a, a footballer? Really early parts, I've got to be honest. It was like, even in... Se- I remember being at senior school and I was in year seven. Uh, Mr. Spall was my head teacher. And... Um, I, all I used to say is I just want to be at football. I want to uh, I want to I want to go and play. I want to go and train. Um, and at school I was a restless kid. It wasn't that it wasn't that I didn't enjoy school because I did, but I just wanted to play football. I look forward to break time to play football. And I remember my teacher, Mr. Sport. He was the head of year, and he said, "Look, Matt, we understand what you, what your aspirations are, but um, you, you need to apply yourself at school as well as." from football because what happens if you if you get injured or uh, something happens that you can't play football anymore and, and I just never saw that I, I, I couldn't accept it and I think in the end they probably agreed to disagree with me and, and it came to I think at 14 Portsmouth offered me a scholarship and um, the school sort of supported me in that so I'll, I'll always be thankful f- for for that because I think it was uh, probably my last two years at school, I, I used to come out of school um, on a Friday and I'd train with um, the youth team. And that was, again, that was great, a great experience for me. I was only a young boy and uh, I was training with what sometimes could have been 19-year-olds because it was, in those, that back, in, back in the day, it was uh, 17s and 19s. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a crazy time, but... It was just always my love for football above everything. So, see, um, how, in your opinion, then, if you know, if parents or, or young guys from in sort of that 15, 16, 17 year old age a gap are listening to this, what can they do physically? Like, how can they change their football lifestyle from taking looking at football as a sense of fun mm-hmm. to treating football like you want it to be your your life career? Yeah, the balance is so. Uh, like, can you remember? Can you remember what you did? The balance is so important. Yeah, sorry. Um, what did I do? I I ran because I knew that physically I weren't as strong or as quick as everyone. That was my biggest weakness, probably athleticism. I was never gifted. I'm, I'm short. I'm stocky. Um, technically, I was probably one of the better ones in my groups. Um, but also, parts I, I I know that um, we we live in in the south, and you know what it's like here, like. It's not, it's not hundreds and hundreds of really good players. Whereas you go to London and you're exposed to top, top players. And we played, um, my club team played a tournament at uh, Hackney Marshes. It was a, it was a massive tournament uh, sponsored by Nike and a huge event. And um, we, played, we played in this tournament and there were like lads, teams and lads from Manchester and um, all the top teams in London and, that, that was an eye-opener for me. We actually, we, we won the tournament 
uh, and I still have the box of Lego that we won it. It was I think it was under twelves or fourteens or whatever. And we won this. We the box of Lego. It's a Subutio Le- Lego. I still have it now. Um, and that was an eye opener for me because I realised that in in Portsmouth, in the round Southampton League or whatever we were playing in, um, I was a good player. But all of a sudden, you go out to London and you get the boys from Manchester and the bigger cities and you're, you're, you're sort of one of many, you know. Uh, and that was motivation for me because I thought, how can I be better than these guys now? The, this, is, this is sort of the, the, the bar. And um, I used to run. I used to run. I used to have a, you know what I'm like, as, as, you, as I've just said, the, a ball everywhere. And I used to go uh, lamppost to lamppost, uh, Privet Road, round past Stoke, Stokes Bay, um, in Gosport and I used to run and, and the next day try and get to the, the, the next lamppost before the and, and just always trying to creep improvement and, and get fitter and I've always done that throughout my career even now today I, I, in the summer as I've said before in the summer I use that as a, as a sort of building block to make sure I'm, the, I'm one of the fittest when we go back Nobody was putting that pressure on you to, to, be, to be fitter like I, I was as a kid you know I was fit but I was never, it wasn't in my mentality, mate, honestly, to, to get fitter, to, like, I, I knew I could run, but I wasn't out running like you were, and I actually didn't know that that's what you were doing at the times. So it wasn't like when you're that age, with young guys in a youth team, you wouldn't have, you know, felt comfortable saying to me, like, oh, I'll go running, like, most, most nights, because you'd have almost felt embarrassed about it. But it wasn't like, that drive wasn't coming from, you know, Sean North, our coach might have been saying to you in particular, because obviously you were, you were a special talent in that group, like maybe you should, you should get fitter as it's going to help you. But there was no other players, no other, your parents probably weren't telling you, Matt, you should go for a run or, or Matt, you're a bit unfit. It was, you were fit. Mm-hmm. Where did that, like, where did that drive to, to become fitter? Like, how, why did you put so much importance on being fitter? I don't even know if I knew at the time. It was just like I had so much energy, um, I was always bouncing around. If I wasn't playing football, I wanted to do something that was involved in football or connected. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just loved it. I loved it. I don't know where it came from. I think, I, when I think back, I remember like, I don't know, I met players, say I met Matty Taylor or, I don't know, some of the, some of the lads that were at Portsmouth that they were top players. I wanted to dress like them. I wanted to, I wanted to watch what they were eating. I, I was just obsessed with football and trainers, I used to I used to do a paper round, and I remember doing the paper round, thinking I'll be able to get an Adidas shell suit at the end of the week. You know, that was what I did. It that's why I did the paper round because I wanted a shell suit the same as the Pompey first team player. Or that's how it was. See, uh, you, you must have spent most of that on All Saints. You got a little bit older, <laughs> didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some All Saints gear back in the day. Um, tell me the story, mate. Because you know I've heard it, but the, but the people listening won't. So I think it's, you know it's quite a, a refreshing story of how you. Where did you used to run when you when you was in Gosport? Whose house did you used to run past? Yeah, I used to run past Northy's house. He was my um, he was my youth team coach. Um, when it, it, this was when I was like probably fifteen, sixteen, and uh, Gary O'Neill, obviously. Uh, he was at Portsmouth at the time, and he had moved from London, and he was living with Sean North. And um, he was like the next big thing. And it was James Keane, similar age, similar age probably. Um, and then Gary O'Neill was like the, the, the young player coming through at Portsmouth. And um, I, used to, I used to go past the green in the village, the village green, and uh, Vinny and, and Shane, Sean's kids, would be playing with, with, with Gaz O'Neill on the, on the village green. And that used to, I used to drive past and think, I'd love to go and get involved in that. But never really, I wasn't really quite connected to them like that you know um so when I was in the summer every summer Northy was always on at me to be fair Matty keep working make sure you come back and and probably Northy was a massive driver and and still is today I still speak to Sean today and uh what a support he's been throughout my career but um I used to, I used to run past the village of thinking I hope Northy sees me running um because I know he'd be chuffed you know and it was it was small things like Pleasing people, I, 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 I've always wanted to please people. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was it, real good, real good childhood memories, really, of, of running, as I say, out past the Kingfisher and down the beach and back past Northeast House. That was like, whoa, that's a good, that's a good stint. It's probably I don't know seven, eight k. 
Um, so yeah, it was good. We're talking about you being a, a special talent, mate. And when you were younger, I always saw you as being like I, I wouldn't argue that at that age you aspire to be someone that you play like. But I could certainly, you know, admired you at that age. And in terms of the, it appeared like you were super confident. You always took the ball. You took risks. You're talking about having a powerful left foot. You'd shoot from everywhere. I remember driving home, my parents thinking, "Oh, like Matt was good today. Matt was good today. Most most weekends, Matt was good today." But see, I've. I've listened to a lot of interviews, mate, obviously in the build-up to this podcast and, and knowing you as I do. I know that you've been super nervous going into new environments. So when you signed for like interviews of you, when you've gone to Swindon, when you've gone to uh, your loan moves from Portsmouth, you signed for Bournemouth, on a, like in, in your first interaction with players at Bournemouth and training, of, of having those feelings of ner- nervousness and, and pressure. But I never, you know... you. you I hid that very well because I never saw that from you. How do you think that you managed to... Because you probably even felt that you were very early age when you start to train with Portsmouth's first team. You must have felt that, you know, those nerves and those pressure, but you never allowed it to take over your body enough for you to, to stop being able to perform. Um, I think it's so relatable at the moment that people find it tough to deal with pressure and to deal with nerves to, to actually go out and perform. And there's something that I've read about recently that's called a flow state where you, you, you don't allow pressure to take over your body and you can just play. And, and you always seem to do that really well. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think anything in life, um, if you care about something in life, th- there's, there's a feeling with that. Um, and I cared about football. I cared about my career. I cared about um, doing well for me. Above everything, it was me. Uh, that I was, that I, I was selfish, really. Um, I used to go into games thinking only about goals and assists knowing that if I score a goal or I can get some assists that will help the team um, and that's still my uh, still my sort of mindset today if I'm individually right collect and do and do the instructions that the managers asked me to, to do if I can carry that out and 10 other lads carry that out as a team we're going to be collectively good so that would be my um Still, my mindset, but the, uh, the the nerves. I think I've always gone into situations nervous. I stand on the first tee at golf when I was ten or whatever I was, and there's still a. I'm confident that I have I, I've got the shot in my in my locker, you know. But I still have a element of hope. This does go down the middle, you know. Like there's still a feeling with that because I I cared so much about golf or whatever it was, whether it was football, golf, table tennis against my dad or whatever. I cared about winning. Um, I wanted to be the winner. I wanted to be the best, the best I could be. Um, in fact, I wanted to be the. At that age, I didn't understand. It was like I want to be the best. Um, so I just nerves, nerves, nerves are still there today. If I if I if I walk out the weekend, there's still nerves. But you learn how to handle handle the nerves, the pressure, the, those feelings, and I think that's what I did from an early age, really. And I love I I love that pressure. Even today, still, I, obviously, I'm injured at the moment, and and I'm missing missing that feeling of the pressure and the 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 strive for success in whatever your goal is. So, see, I want to get a little bit more detail out of you, that mate. When you're talking about feeling nervous, and and the interviews that I've seen about you joining new clubs and first training sessions and stuff like that, what do you think? Like, because a lot of people will go through that. They join new clubs and. Was it either the the perception of how you wanted your new teammates to, to see you or or was it, the, did you question, am I good? Because bearing in mind when you signed for places like Notts County, Dagenham, you were on loan from a, a high level. When you signed for Swindon, you'd come from a high level. So you knew you could play at that at that level. Like what's, where did those, talk to me a little bit more detail about, about how the nerves felt and what you ended up doing to overcome them. Yeah, good. Um, a good, really good learning curve for me in that sense was Dagenham and Redbridge. I went on loans at Dagenham and Redbridge, and uh, I was so I was so nervous the first time I moved away from home. Um, first, first time I've been on loan, first league football, first, first sort of uh, eye opener to being actually in a dressing room where it was like life or death for these lads. It was like food on the table or not, sort of thing. Um, and that was that was amazing for me. But the manager, John Still, at the time, uh, Harry Redknapp's uh, close friend, and and John Still was the manager. And um, I went on loan there, and I was I think I'd just turned eighteen or maybe seventeen, 
And John still said to me, he said, uh, come in, work your socks off and enjoy yourself. And I can't thank him enough for that because that's literally what I did. But in terms of nerves, I remember going into, into the dressing room and the environment was, it was like, it was a real man's environment, you know, I, I wasn't ready for it really. And the, the, above, above being a good, a good player and performing, the lads wanted you to be a good, good lad. You know, like I, I worked that out very quickly. Like if there was a few lads that were a little bit lively and you can imagine what, what some lads were like, um, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't get a chance on the pitch because straight away the, the mind was made up before they went on the grass. Um, so I'm, I, I, I sort of learned that very quickly probably from, from seeing examples in the Dagenham dressing room. And I was like, why, is it, why are the boys so harsh on this kid? And it was because in the dressing room and off the pitch, he's bouncing around, thinking he run the show. And I learned from, from the bad ones, if you like. Uh, and that carried me through my career. And like you say, I remember coming to Bournemouth. Bournemouth were flying at the time. I'd signed from Swindon. Um, a real close-knit team. Uh, even then... And I remember coming in and it's like, you want, you're want you going into a new environment. You want the lads to like you. You want to be likeable. Um, and after that, I think you get you build relationships off the pitch. All of a sudden you go on the pitch, you feel like I'm with my mate on the pitch here. Um, so, so so many small things that people people probably don't take into account um, when you go into a football club. And the older you get, the easier it becomes because everyone knows that uh, if you go up to someone and shake someone's hand, you they think, oh, he's a nice lad. He's come and say hello. He's put himself out, and um, that becomes an easier thing to do. But I, w- I would always say, for for younger players, be polite, have manners, have respect. It takes you such a long way, such a long way. Sometimes it takes you further than your ability. So tell me how somebody who wants to become a professional footballer or or is a professional footballer and wants to aspire to play to the to the top level like you have. How can they combine being selfish, like you've said you you were a lot, uh, you know, arguably because of your success, you sort of have to be. How can you combine being selfish with being a good teammate? I think I think honesty is key. I think um, be, 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 being selfish is fine if you can be a good team player and you're you're with your team. You know, if you're if you're doing if you're doing everything you possibly can to be the best player you can be um, and you may there may be moments where you dig your teammate out or you ask for more from your teammates um, but you have to be able to accept that in reverse um, but I, I feel like people respect that people respect that as long as they can see as, as, if I have a teammate and I can see that he's giving everything um, he might be having a bad day or uh, as I say vice versa I think that um I think it's acceptable. Everyone has bad days. Everyone has a bad game. Everyone has a bad touch. Everyone has a bad time, a bad moment, a bad month, a bad year. Everyone. It's how it's how you react to that and how you carry yourself through that. It's easy when you're scoring goals, when you're making assists, when everything's going well. It's how you act when it's not going so well that I think is is a huge, huge thing. And and really, will. We'll, those moments will dictate the direction that your career goes. So on the surface, if anybody looked at your career, it would look like, I mean, possibly when you left Portsmouth, but that, you know, it was a difficult first team to break into at that, at that time. But since then, you loan at Notts County and Dagenham was successful. You won Young Player of the Year at, at Portsmouth while she was out on loan. You went to Swindon, you got promoted out, out of League Two and, and performed incredibly well in League One. You go to Bournemouth, you get promoted, you get promoted, you're in the Premier League, you go to Newcastle, you get promoted. I mean, on the surface, if anybody had a page of your of your CV, mate, of your clubs, they would argue that you've never been, been through anything negative. Like, it's, everything looks positive. This, this geezer's had nothing but success. Have you ever had, a, you know, what moments have you struggled, uh, I guess, for form? Or, or have you ever questioned your, your love for it? Or, or when you're speaking there on, on people who have tough moments, maybe tough days, tough weeks, tough years, have you ever? Yeah, for sure, yeah. So many um, throughout, throughout my career, really, from the, from the get-go. Uh, as you know, my dream was always Portsmouth. It was like Portsmouth's my club. Um, as you say, Harry Redknapp built an unbelievable team there at, at just, probably just the wrong time for me. 
in the sense that uh, I was I, think I was probably 16, 17 and just won the FA Cup. Um, players like Diara, Montari. You ended up uh, making two Premier League appearances, though. Yeah, yeah, I did in the end. But again, that was um, that was a little bit later. And whilst we were relegated, so we were in the Premier League, we, we, I think we had already been relegated. Um, we played Wigan and then uh, Aston Villa the last few games under Avram Grant. But um, the, the, the toughest moment was leaving Portsmouth, definitely. I'd been on loan and I really loved playing. I, I, I loved playing so much that I went back to Portsmouth and... I started playing uh, the first 10 games in the championship, I think it was. Uh, really enjoyed it, loved it. Played left back out of position. I was learning. I felt like I was I was doing all right. But I was the young one and, and um, the manager at the time signed a few more experienced players and I fell by the wayside and I was sitting watching on a Saturday. And when you had a taste of, I'd been at, um, I'd been at Dagenham and played 30, 35 games or something, scored 11 goals and five assists or whatever it was. Uh, it was like, this is good. Went to Notts County, similar thing. Had a really successful spell there. Loved it again, away from home, meeting new people, new challenges. Um, met some great lads there and uh, went back to Portsmouth. And it didn't, I didn't quite just fall into play, playing, you know. And, and when I fell out of sort of, the, I wasn't even getting on at the weekend or something. And it only happened for probably four weeks and I was like I need to play this is no good for me like, I'm, I'm going I feel like I'm going stagnant I just want to kick a ball basically and uh, we decided I went on loan in January with the manager and um, I went to Swindon and um, that season was fantastic they were really they were doing really well I had to fight to get in the team even at Swindon which was uh, which was good for me because it was like hold on a minute. I, as a kid you think oh, I'm going to Swindon I'm going to play but it's you realise soon, quickly, there's good players at Swindon and we were in League One at the time. There's, there's very good players there, you know, and, and like I said earlier about the London boys being a bigger bigger city, better players. I went to Swindon and Danny Ward was there. He's on absolute fire. Like, every week I was sitting there thinking, why have they signed me here? Like, this guy's unbelievable. He's playing uh, right wing. And uh, the boys done great and I played a part in that season. That was a really good experience. But um, the next season then, I signed for Swindon. We got relegated, and that was a that was the that was the first moment in my career. I thought this is this is going to be tough to get back to where I where I where I thought I was going, you know. Um, and I I really had to work hard. Ultimately, that was that was the first first season that I thought I've got to give everything here. Not not, not that I hadn't given everything before. I, I've got to give everything here to to make sure my luck comes in and and I can either perform and and make get a move for myself and use this as a platform or with Swindon let's try and get promoted and and we did uh, we got promoted from from League 2 under De Canio and again amazing experience um, I still speak to him now and what a, what a man played a, such a huge huge part in my life um, in terms of principles how I should live my life as a professional footballer and um, he was amazing and then Bournemouth, similar thing. I think Bournemouth was a such good time, and obviously with with the gaffer being being the gaffer, you 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 saw it in for your, in first hand with your own eyes, and <clears throat> the mentality, the culture that he created throughout the club. Um, it was hard not to go there and and buy into it. It was like this is just what an environment to go and to go and play in. You know, it wanted you to play forward, wanted you to express yourself. As a team, gave us everything we could possibly ever ask for. Um, as a club, the same. Uh, it was just, it was brilliant, and I, I, I loved every minute of it. And um, there were tough times. There were times where Gaffer would take me off, and I'd be thinking, "Why is he taking me off?" And um, you, you, the biggest quality that the Gaffer had, in my opinion, was when I look back, I played every game under under him that I was fit near enough, and only. Every Thursday, I thought, I hope I play at the weekend. And it's only since I've left um, and and looked back that you realise, how did he make me think that every Thursday? Yet yeah, for four and a half years, I played every game, really, that was fit. And that's a skill in itself, I think. And it certainly kept you on your toes. And I think that was the same for all the lads. Um, but yeah. That, um, that identity that, I mean, I can give people an insight into... 
your identity, especially as a young player coming through at Portsmouth, is is Matt Ritchie was well known in the area. He was, you know, you were the guy that like we talk you've mentioned Gary O'Neill already, but Gary O'Neill was sort of like the Portsmouth poster boy of he came through the youth team, played in the first team, super successful. You were the next Gary O'Neill, and that was everybody had that expectation of you. Um and recently Declan Rice has, has spoken to Gary Neville. I'm not sure how you know how much I should plug other podcasts, but <laughs> the like the open goal you did with um obviously with Cy Ferry about the Kenny, I will get on like I'm not gonna ask you all the stupid stories, but I'm I'm gonna ask you in more detail how, how he was good. But this Gary Neville podcast obviously he speaks to Declan Rice about his identity as a young player and how that when he left Chelsea as a young player he felt like he lost his identity. Um and I'm interested to know like just into a little bit more detail because a lot of kids, parents, will have a kid that goes through an academy for, for a long time, get to the age of 15, 16, sometimes get through into the youth team and then they, they drop out or they make a first team appearance that doesn't work out for them. As, as For example, what happened to you? How difficult was it for you to get over You know the loss of, I guess, that identity of being Portsmouth's young star that was, that was destined to, to go into the first team? There was no time for it, parts, to be honest. There's no time. Um, it was like, you know what football was like. It, it Did you know that then, though? Um, yeah, I knew, yeah, I knew that uh, I, need, I need to perform, ultimately. Um, yeah, I, me- I remember signing for Swindon, and I remember signing for Swindon thinking, this is a platform for me to go and express myself. I have to make sure I use it, because if I fall from here, I'm probably falling out of leagues. Um, so I knew... It was it was ultimately down to me, and that was that. Um, There's no other route. Um, you and t- I've spoken to Charlie Daniels recently. Obviously, he spent a long time with the Bournemouth, and one of the questions that I asked him because Charlie's career path took him from Tottenham's reserves, almost in the first team, similar to you at Portsmouth, dropped in down to Leighton Orient, and then he signed for uh, Bournemouth, and obviously had lift off, similar to you in a way, really, where he left Portsmouth, signed for Swindon. Ended up having lift off, signed for Bournemouth, and, and that and sort of like ended up being super successful. But I asked Charlie, when you left Tottenham, were you a Premier League player or did you become a Premier League player? Because obviously, as we know now, the pair of you have played in the Premier League, you've made over 160 appearances in the Premier League. So we know you're a Premier League player. I asked him, did you feel like one when you left Tottenham or did you become one? He said, no, I was always a Premier League player. How yeah. did you feel? Yeah, Chaz has got a good mentality. That's what, uh, again... I think it shows, like you said, his uh, his career, his drive. Chaz's Chaz's mentality was was yeah, second well, to none. Yeah. The amount of the amount of players that um, even that I saw that we signed in very good players, by the way, as well that we signed in in his position at Bournemouth as competition, and Chaz just up to every time like no, nah, it's not happening, and and he come back in that. That preseason, he come back. He was flying, and it was like he made the made made the decision for the manager by himself. You know, it is it, impossible. So, again, mentality, and uh, I've got a challenge on my hands. How am I going to approach this? Am I going to? But what about you, mate? When you left, when you left Portsmouth, you played in the Premier League twice. You played in the Championship ten times. You knew that you were a good player. Uh huh. Did you feel like you get relegated from Swindon, right? In League One, you're in League Two now. Yeah. You've made Premier League appearances. Do you feel like a Premier League player this in League Two or do you think you became a Premier League player over time? No, I became one in my opinion. In my opinion, I became one because I had so many weaknesses. Uh, as I said, my strengths were my strengths. Um, but I had to develop. I had to, I had to, my decision making was, when I was younger, was really bad. Um, as I say, I just thought, oh, I've got a powerful left foot. I'm going to shoot every time I get within 25 yards. And that's what I did. And to a certain level, that, that got me success. Um, but as soon as I met Eddie, um, as soon as I met Eddie, it was like, mate, this is one area that we really need to brush up on. Like, you're in great positions, but you need to slide your striker in, or you need to play another pass before you get your shot. Or so that was a that was an area that we really worked on at Bournemouth, um, and as a team, I think collectively, uh, we became better and better and better in and around the box because we had to because teams would in the end teams would come and sit and. Bank up. So yeah, no, I, I developed. I developed definitely for sure. I'm not trying to embarrass you, mate, by bigging you up too much. But <laughs> you know, even even though you were, and I keep mentioning it because you know there'll be kids like this everywhere, and and parents probably like people who listen to this who are parents might have the child that's the the outstanding talent in their age group. 
but you were always asking questions. It wasn't like that you were, you know, an outstanding player, but thought you were better than everybody else. You were very inquisitive, always wanted to ask questions, uh, wanted to learn, super enthusiastic, as, as we've talked about. You just mentioned there that you, you felt like you became a Premier League player after, you know, making appearances already. Was it me and Eddie that, you know, that really managed to, to manipulate your thought process about football? Like what was, because you were asking questions before that, we'll get to the Canio in, in, in a bit, obviously, as well. But how did you, like for people's benefit, like how did you learn what you thought you already knew everything about? Just watching more than anything, I'd say. I'd, like you say, I was always asking questions, why Why are we doing this? Or even to myself, I'd, have question, I'd ask questions. We were doing a passenger, I was thinking. Well, you had to sit out most of those at the yeah. start, didn't you? Gaffer used to say to me, mate, sit at the side. He pulled me out of one, I remember. We were, do, we were doing a passenger and I just could not get it for, for love nor money. And uh, in the end, he was like, mate, just stand on the side and watch it. And it was only then really that I realised how I, I need to, I'm a visual learner, I need to do, I need to see it to, to be able to then go and put it into practice and um, yeah, it was, uh, he used to pull his hair out of me, I'm sure, even now still he does. Um, but yeah, the, the, just, just watching and observing, even now I'm, I'm, there's so many, I've got so many different interests and I think like YouTube now for me, it's just amazing. You can, you can go on and, and watch someone do something that you want to learn or, um, pick up so yeah no it's uh, just inquisitive probably so, annoying at times <laughs> so if guys who, who are playing now already or who are young and, and, are, and are learning what what is your advice then ultimately on, on how they can learn on uh, give us an insight into you know when how did you feel like what did Matt Ritchie look like when he thought he was a great player to when he was actually a great player what was the difference um I never, I never thought I was a great player. It's probably my biggest strength. Um, I don't think I was a great player, parts to be honest, or I am a great player. I, th I think that I have tools. Um, well, even even when you were younger and and you know you were spoken about, you were playing up age groups because that must have, uh, yeah, you know. of course, like I said earlier, it's, it's it's good, it's recognition. But even when we won the championship at Bournemouth, and my my overriding feeling, I stood on the pitch at Charlton away and. I stood there and I, re I regret it slightly to now looking back because I didn't, I didn't enjoy the moment. It was like, this is another step in the right direction. But all the like smudges going along the fans, singing with the fans and the boys were all bouncing around. And there's no, I've got nothing against that. I wish that I, was in, I wish that I was that personality and I could do that. But in my, I, I remember standing there thinking, you should go and enjoy this. But I, I couldn't. It was just like, I don't know, it was just like, what was going I've, through your I've mind? not made. I remember the feeling. I remember. I remember feeling like it's just another step. It's another. It's another step in the right direction. That it's. I'm. I'm not in my destination yet that I want to be at. Uh, I was always so hungry to play in the Premier League. Every. Every. Everyone's dream is to play in the Premier League, and. Um, yeah. Some. Someone said to me once when I. I. I'd, I'd, I'd been at back and forth, young, back and forth to on loans, as we say, uh, not to get the clubs I've been to. And someone, someone once said to me, he said, uh, "You found your level," and he didn't mean it in a he didn't mean it in a nasty way, you know. What level were you playing at that, that time? I think I was League One. Right. He was like, "You found you, you you found your level. You seem settled now," and it stuck with me forever. It stuck with me forever. Did it hurt you? It hurt, yeah. It, when he when he said it, I was like, "Oh." found my level like no I'm nowhere near my level and honestly that's been my that's been my, my my motivation was not that but that that really that was at like a, maybe I might have been 21 22 um, stoked the fire yeah that really stuck today even now I think I think about it, it like, oh. um, so that stuck with me and fear of failure I never wanted to fail if you You'd be super interested, mate, to know that how many people, you know, at the end, I'll ask some questions a little bit quicker. And a lot of, you know, what advice would you give to yourself? Ask everybody. And, and a lot of them say, oh, I'd, I'd ask myself to enjoy it more. I'd go back and I don't enjoy more. And it's interesting that you just say that because if you went back and treated that moment any differently, or you didn't think, oh, I've had success here, but I want to go again, then arguably you might not be as successful as you have been and, and continue to be. So there's, I think there's a fine line really between, you know, when, if your advice would be to someone oh, to enjoy it, but 
you know, not to the point of where you lose sight of where you want to where you want to be. So I think that's actually a you know a, an incredible attribute that you do have is that you're able to have success and allow it to to drive you forward. And most of the guys that I've spoken to that play at the top top level, and even to be fair, the ones that you know are playing in the national league, we've all sort of had that difficult moments and and allowed it to drive you, or or even successful moments allowed it to, to drive you. How how important do you think that that's been for you? Um, you know, as a measure is your success. Yeah, definitely massive. Um, I think the good moments you want more of, um, but it's like a drug that that feeling of of striving for success and whatever success is in in your head or in your in your life, whatever that may be, that the it's the it's the journey to get there that 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 is is the enjoyable bit really. Because as soon as you as soon as you reach your goal, no matter what it is, as soon as you reach your goal, you set a new goal. Because your life doesn't finish then, you know. You, you whatever you whatever your goal is, you you'll reach it, and there's another goal. There's more, there's always more. There's always you can always get better. You can always improve. So, no matter what it's been, for sure, it's always been. You have to be real. In my opinion, you have to be realistic. Um, how far can your attributes or um, qualities take you um, but you can always work harder at them get better at them so you can always continue to raise Eddie Howe used to say to us lads we're not changing anything we do we're going to continue to work and play the same way we play but we're going to raise the bar and that that mo- that saying of we're going to raise the bar I've taken with me in all of all of my life do you do a goal is goal setting something that you've done you know throughout your career yeah for sure what does that process look like for you then I used to write down how many assists I'd like in a season, how many goals I'd like in a season. If I hit the target earlier, say I got to 10 goals by, I don't know, I'd say, right, I want another seven goals before the end of the season. Um, just I just used to write it down on a note. I'm always making notes on notepads and things like that. So I used to write it down on a notepad. I used to write down, uh, I still do today, if, if, uh, if we have a game, I try and write down a list of, um, two or three things that I want to achieve in the game, whether that be I want to I want to make four crosses in the first half, just so I have a clear and that's developed over time. This was when I was young. I used to write down goals, assists. My dad would say, "Oh, how many goals do you think you're going to get, or whatever?" Um, and that's just developed and evolved over time. Um, I worked with a psychologist when I was at Bournemouth. Really lucky, great man. Um, again, some of the tools that he's given me, I'll pass on to my children and. And they've taken me a long way in life, so and uh, taught me a lot. So um, yeah, it's just just de- trying to develop every day. I think that's at Bournemouth. I think if you spoke to any of the lads at Bournemouth collectively, everyone as a person and as a football player were better. We're looking to try and get as many takeaways for for people to improve their game as possible, mate. Obviously, on this podcast, since the you know the leave no doubt name and and stuff, so. Can you give us an insight into some of those things you took from that psychologist or, or are you going to keep yeah. it to yourself? No, no, no. Um, I mean, I won't go into like detail, but it was it was more about what's important. Um, I remember at Bournemouth at the time, we'd had success in a short spell. Uh, so it was like some, there were, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that any of the boys lost their way, but there were, there were probably elements of things that all of a sudden the boys could have things that they could never have before. They could have a big house, they could have flash cars, they could have a watch. Things that you, from the outside you see, and as a young kid you think, ah, oh, they're footballers, they got this, they got that. It, it's, it's really not important. Um, and th- don't get me wrong, every, every one of us growing up, we, we see it, we want it. It's human nature, um, but it's not important. It's not important. Your performance on a Saturday is the most important thing and pleasing your teammates, pleasing your manager and ultimately pleasing yourself. With There's no better feeling than playing well on Saturday for your, for, for your team. There's no better feeling. I think throughout this conversation already, um, you know, sort of about 50 minutes in now, you, you've mentioned um, Eddie's name a lot as, a, you know, one of your best managers. He's spoken about the Canio um, and you know, and to plug another a podcast again, I'm going to remind people that this, you know, Cy Ferry's Open Goal podcast that you've done with him is an incredible insight into maybe some of the the more mental stories of the Canio and, and now he was a bit of a character and someone, you know, you'd be able to go there and have a laugh. But 
you speak about him in in a different way to others. Like you, you, you know, you do tell the stories of of the you know the nutty stuff that he used to do, but he had an incredible incredible impact on on your career and um, arguably since working with him, that was you know what helped you to to progress as what you did. So I'm interested for people's insight. You know, if any Swindon fans end up watching this who, who want to see you know get a bit of an insight into Matt Ritchie's Swindon career. What do you think it was, you know, we'll get into detail, but what do you think it was overridingly about him um, that went so well for you? Uh, the, big, the, biggest, the biggest thing that the Canio sort of opened my eyes to was nutrition. I never, before I met him, I was never exposed to how important it was to what to eat for energy, for uh, recovery. I never knew anything about that, really. I was just pasta and cheese and pasta and... Uh, I used to drive to Swindon train. I'd have a bag of Skittles in my car, and um, that was that was like normality. I didn't know what I didn't know if there was anything wrong with that. I didn't know there was anything wrong with that. Um, and as you as you I'm sure you're aware, the Italians are very um, specific with what what the players are eating and and, and taking on board. So it took away sauces. Yeah, and the Canio took away uh, sauces, orange juice, um, so many different things. It was like at dinner we had water. Um, everything was measured. It was it was good, and that was a. We, we were in League Two at the time, so it was like a lot of the boys hadn't seen this, and a lot of the boys rebelled and, and went against it. But as you said, I mean, I always. Um, this is like the can, Paolo De Canio is telling us this. Like, there's there's method in the madness, you know. Um, so I went along with it and, and bought into it, and I would say I got my rewards because it was certainly. It was the fittest I've ever been. Um, as you said about size podcast, the, the fat little piggy uh, comment that, um, that he made the first time he met me. Um, he'd said, the chairman's told me, well, you, you're meant to be my best player, but you look like a fat little piggy. And, and that, that again, that was like, I don't want him to think that of me. I, I, like, I, want him to, I want him to think I'm ready and I'm, I'm, I'm the man, you know. Um, and that, that pre-season, we were in 54 days straight. Uh, no recovery days run 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 and I was the fittest I've ever been and um, by that time at the end of that pre-season I didn't I still didn't know about the nutrition so much obviously it was just getting sort of uh, implemented within the group and uh, throughout that season throughout that time with him I learned a lot um, Claudio was his fitness coach and Claudio's a great man really intelligent uh, a lot of knowledge I worked in so many different sports uh, he now works with the the Italian FA, and um, he 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 taught me an, an awful lot. So being exposed to to top level people, that obviously the Can if the Canio thinks Claudio is good enough to come in and be his his sort of fitness coach, nutrition guy, then this is the Canio. And when 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 I went to when the Canio was coming to Swindon, obviously you go online, you look what's what's his career and this that and the other, and everyone knows him, but what's he really like and I think there's so many YouTube videos of how he used to train he was the he was the last one in training he used to have his person he used to have a personal trainer after training so he'd train in the morning and then run in the afternoon with with his private training uh, coach um, so that sort of that mentality excited me it was like I'm going to get exposed to what the what the players at the absolute top do and I'd had a taste of it at Portsmouth but then to get those um, tools around you again. You, you may that may never come again. And I felt like with the Canio, I was like, "This is it. This is this is here. He's going to push us." And I bought into it, and and I got my rewards. I loved it. See, um, I was trying to bring it up and focus on it, but that you know that shout that he give you on the first day, you know the little picky shout, and somebody else, as you've told us, saying, "Oh, you found your level in League One." Like these these things that people have said to you that almost hurt you a little bit. You've never allowed those to affect you so negatively that you've you know that you've that you've crumbled ultimately or that you've let them affect you past the point of that you've not been able to progress how important is it do you think that people build a mindset because everybody takes shit right now abuse online everybody's opinion is has got a platform to to be read and a lot of people can get affected by those sorts of stuff but you you know you've never allowed that to happen to you how important do you think that mentality mentality is yeah, I think um, nowadays it's so different parts, as you say, like, I, I'm probably, even in even in our era, I've never never had any social media from a young, young age, like, 
Facebook, I think, was the last thing I had. I was probably 15, 16, and I got sick of Pompey, Pompey friends sort of thing asking me for tickets for the weekend. I thought, well, this is this is only people that contact me on Facebook, just people saying, oh, can you grab us a ticket for the weekend? So that went, but... Um, and that's probably... It's probably been a, a... I don't know what my career would have been like if I had had social media or whatever, because... I think any any media, any press, whatever it is, if it's negative about you, it, it affects you in a way, definitely. Um, it may fuel you, you may use it as fuel, but for sure it's a, it's not a nice thing. I remember when I, when I signed for Newcastle, uh, the local paper, the Chronicle would... Uh, I mean, we were flying, and then I went for a patch through Christmas. I couldn't... I couldn't uh, nothing could go right for me, nothing dropped for me, you know? And I remember picking up the paper on the way into training and it was like, I might have got a six in the paper or something. And it was like, Richie's not at it at the minute or whatever, you know, and, and that, that sticks with me today still. And s- since that season, I try and not, I try and not see the, the reports and things like that, you know. Obviously, people send you things if it's good, but good or bad, it's, it's so difficult to have that balance of what you do with other people's opinion ultimately you, I'm, I'm my own biggest critic. I knew if I played bad, good or bad at the weekend. Um, I know if I need to work harder on something. I know if I need to um, pinpoint something that needs improvement and I need help with the coaches or whatever it is. Um, I would say judge yourself. Be your, be your own judge and and uh, try and try and cut out the outside noise because ultimately the only person's opinion that matters is yours and the manager's. You never had social media, obviously, ever, did you? Uh, you know, you've had teammates trying to get you on it and, and pepper you about it. Just never, you just never bothered. I just like, where did that? Where did it come from? That just the lack of desire to to do it. Honestly, it was uh, it was when I was at Portsmouth. I just got in in and around the Portsmouth setup, and uh, I remember I used to get messages from people that, that like I knew them, but I didn't know them. If you know what I mean, um, and they'd say, "Ah." Oh, can you get me two tickets for the? I mean, people have got more front than front than Asda, haven't they? I said, oh, can you can you get me uh, two tickets for the weekend and things like this? And I'm thinking, like, I don't even know this guy. Well, people thought they knew you because it, yeah. local local yeah. guy, yeah. And and I was a, I'm a, I would say I was a nice kid, you know. I was thinking like, oh, I need to write back to him and say like, oh, sorry, <laughs> mate, I can't get. But this got like out of hand, or maybe once or twice I might have got them some, you know. Excuse me, Sol Campbell, can I have thirty tickets, please? This is what I'm saying, like. And, and I've just started travelling the first team. The last thing you want to do is be like, oh, can I get seven tickets for all my mates, you know? Um, so, yeah, that, that, that was like, I was like, I'm accessible here to people that I don't even know. I don't like this. And I was just getting asked for things and I thought, oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm coming off of that. Um, and I've never had any desire. Uh, I've never had any desire for it. I've, I've just, football's there. Football, let's just play football, you know? So let's get back onto the Canio then before we move on. What was the, um, you know, give us a little insight there as to how you felt when you came in because you knew you were going to be exposed to, to top elite coaching and top elite mentality. But what were the long lasting, I know you're obviously still in touch with him a bit, but what was the long, you know, those long lasting memories and takeaways that you, that you took from him that stayed with you? Be as fit as you can possibly be. Your body, my, my body that pre-season was, I mean, I was... So fit parts it gave me. It. I didn't know that you could push yourself that hard. Like you'd you'd run and you'd be thinking, I'm gonna be sick here. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shit myself. You know that's how it felt. Honestly, every day, this is every day. Two sessions, three sessions. Sometimes it was crazy. Um, but I bought into it, and so did so did a lot of the lads. A lot of that we had a really good team at the time for that level, and um, we were successful. And it was because we were fitter than everyone else. It wasn't that we had better players than everyone else. We were fitter than everyone else. Um, so that that was something that made me think my, the sky's the limit you, you, you only put you're the only person that could put a limit on yourself you know um, and mm-hmm. you see like even now you, I look at like these guys breaking breaking the records of marathons and things like that and I understand sports science and, and stuff's moving on but ultimately it's uh, it's it's just more controlled I think because of all the data and stuff like that but the sky's the limit You've always been, you know, you've always put a lot of emphasis on your fitness. We, you know, you've given us an insight as a 14, 15 year, year old, like going in extra runs most nights on, on your own. So it wasn't like that you got that, obviously, from Decanio. You had that 
you know, burning within you from, from an early age. I want to get into you a little bit, I know, but I, I want other people to understand that, especially players, it'd be nice for other people to get an insight into what an elite professional footballer does in their summer holidays, but it's not just, you know, you specifically never went on the lads' holidays, you know, you never went away to, to relax and, and to, to take your foot off. You went on holidays where you could combine it with your training. You went to Italy to cycle. You went, you know, whenever you were going anywhere else, you'd uh, agree for a trainer to be there or to find a pitch to play on. How important do you think that that mentality is ultimately to be successful? I know not everybody does it. And there's obviously a lot of Premier League superstars who will go away and will, will turn the phone off and, and not do any training. Yeah, well, but, yeah, most of the elite professionals now are training in the summer. It's you know it's a real big opportunity to get better, and you always did that. You know I've trained with you a lot of summers, and and I thought I was doing enough, and then I've realised what you were doing, and and I was behind. What what was it? What is that mentality like in a summer for you? Yeah, the men- the mentality was always I can make gains here because I knew I didn't I I never I never been into the party lifestyle. Obviously, as you know, I've been with them for since a young age, and and to be fair, if it wasn't for Emma, she. She sort of kept me on the straight and narrow. Obviously, the lads are all going on holidays of wherever they're going. Like she's not, she's not having that. I you know, you know what she's we like. Had a couple of nights where, like, early days, young. Yeah. I remember you just saying, "Like, that ain't for me. I ain't no. doing that again. I never, no. I never saw you out again." Yeah, it, 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 I just didn't enjoy it. I just, I didn't. I'm not good at dancing. Um, I didn't like drinking. So it's like, what am I going out for? You know, I had a missus. Um, so yeah, the, I just, I don't know. I just, I just really didn't enjoy it. I don't enjoy that environment now still. Like, if I was going to go out now, it's, it's for, for food or whatever, but certainly don't enjoy, like, a nightclub environment. It's not for me. So, um, like to, to tail off slightly, we'll get back to, to your summers, but how were you then able to, to make such long-lasting friendships with teammates and have such good relationships with teammates without doing the whole, I'm going out, having a drink and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, I, I think in the end, people respect, people respect it. I mean, the amount of times someone said to me, oh, come on, man, like, just once, just come, just come for an hour, just come for two hours. Like, if I had a pound for every time someone said that, like, unbelievable, you know? Um, and I was just strong. I was just in the zone. As, as a younger player, I was strong. I was in the zone that that's not good. It's not what professional footballers do. Um, but then, as I say, I, I did go out a few times and I just didn't enjoy it. Um, it wasn't an environment I felt comfortable in and I didn't want to be there. Um, Ultimately, and then I don't know. I just I just did things I enjoyed. I found cycling. I love cycling, as you know. Um, I feel like it's good. It's good for recovery. Um, it was like it was like something I enjoyed, not football, but also it could benefit my physical state. You know, so I, I love that. I still love it today. Um, yeah, I just I, I don't know. I, I didn't really didn't really have any appetite and I didn't really not 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 care what people think because I I do everyone cares what people think um but I was just just had a such strong belief of yeah I had a strong belief that it wasn't good for me I didn't enjoy it why should I do it um and I was as I say I was lucky I had my missus that we'd been together a long long time and and she 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 she's never been into it either really and um and that was that we we sort of steer clear of it and and I sort of look back now and I think, like M, M's dad always says, oh, when I was young, I was, he's a Geordie actually, believe it or not. And he says, oh, I used to go out on the drink and this and the other. He says, oh, I wasted so much money and so, so many years of my life being silly, really. And when you when you get slightly older, you look back and think, really, what was it all for? You know? Um, and, and I sort of, am I proud of it? I'd, I'd say I'm proud of who I am, yeah. I'm proud that I was strong enough to say no uh, numerous times to, to clo- as you say, close friends. A lot, even my close friends would be like, "Come on, mate, just, just for one, just, just for an hour." And I'd say no, because I know that if I go for an hour, it's two hours, three hours, and then they're all drunk or whatever, and you've got to leave. It's like I just never put myself in that position, and I still don't now today. I think it's a great example, mate. Honestly, to to people who want to ultimately be elite footballers, not just footballers, but elite athletes that. That, that, that's what you've got to do. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to sit here and say no, cause that's the only everything way. I do yeah. is perfect. You know, like I eat junk food. I have, you know, what I mean. Like yeah, I'm yeah. not. I, I probably cycle when I shouldn't cycle. You know, so I'm not perfect. But it, that environment just wasn't for me. And as I say, still not today. But there's a time and a place for it for sure. And even, I mean, there are there are some nights out that, especially at Bournemouth. I mean, 
think it was uh, after Christmas, and the lads will swear to you that Matty, the Christmas do, is what what got us on that run. It brought the lads together, and I mean, I don't buy it personally, um, but Frano will tell you, Matty, I'm telling you, it was the Christmas do that brought us together for that run in January or whatever. So, yeah. Go on, then, mate. On the flip, talk us to, to, about your summers. How how would you? So, say it's um, this summer coming up. You know, the pair of us, both 32 years old now, I think you just turned 33. 33, yeah. You're an early, early one, isn't you? Yeah. September. So Thanks you're coming up to a summer. How do you plan your summer? What goes through your head? Well, now it's changed parts. Obviously, you've got the kids to think about and um, you want to please them, really. Um, but even now, still, obviously, being up in Newcastle, I really enjoy coming home, um, having a feeling of, of being at home. When, you, when, you're not, when you're not living there all the time, it's, it's uh, something that you miss. So yeah, to, to come home, I love it. You got the seaside, you got the the forest. Um, so I enjoy my time here, but I'm sort of feeling a little bit of pressure now. Actually, the kids are like, "Daddy, can we go to the water park?" Or um, they love the slides and things like that. So and and also, I want them to see the world. I want them to to experience uh, different places, different cultures. So there's a there's a there's a small amount of pressure being applied from from Harry mainly, but. Um, my summer now, I, I just try and play tennis, cycle. I do try and have two, two or three weeks where I really switch off. And, and but even that, though, though, you get to the third week and you're itching, you're itching to go again. And as I said to you before, I think that the summer is a great time to to put yourself in a really good, strong position to go back and be like in the manager's in the manager's forefront of his mind and. Um, if you're the fittest player going back, I think that so as long as your your performances throughout pre-season are good, I think, um, and fitness as well. If, if you're the fittest player, you're less fatigued, your decision-making's better, the quality on the ball's better, because uh, you're physically in a, in a, in a good shape to, to perform and um, any head start against not only your teammates, but obviously the, the opposition um, is so important now. See, even recently, like I, I missed you after um, you know Newcastle played Tranmere, didn't they in the league in in the league cup? And I remember missing you and saying, um, you know, I watched the game, perform well, but it wasn't so much you know performance on the ball. I remember thinking, God, he's not played for a while, and he's uh, he seems to be all over the place. Like you, you never like you. I know you're you're a powerful runner. You always have been, but I remember thinking, how's he not been able to play for so long and still look like he's so fit and he's able to and not just like fit as in like I'm running around the pitch. But able to like jump a press hard back into your position, like every, all your, your hard running lasted for ninety minutes, which is tough on, on on people's legs. How have you managed to? And you gave me an insight in, into some of the stuff that you do, but for, like, for the benefit of people listening, so what does it look like when you're not necessarily in the team as much as what you'd like to be, mm-hmm. but you're still game ready? How how do you manage to do that? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a something again that I've learned over the last probably two or three years, where there have been moments where I've not been in the team. Um, but I've, I'm, I'm, I've got to say, parts. I'm so lucky at, at Newcastle. We've got obviously a fantastic environment to work in, uh, all the all the tools that we could possibly need. But um, it's more about the people. The people we got Dan Hodges, uh, who you know, um, who's S and C and 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 sort of any CV stuff and and running any anything you ask for or any you say I want to top up or whatever, he's there. He'll support you. Uh, he'll guide you, and then we got a guy called Nick Grantham in the gym. That um, Nick's Nick's sort of uh, no 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 sort of frills, but solid, good solid work that keeps you strong, keeps you physically in a, in a really good place. And um, and I've been really lucky, really really lucky with with as I say, good staff, but a um, a really good environment, good good uh, good coaches. So. Um, obviously, you have to have appetite to go and do it and work hard. But um, yeah, I knew I, I knew going into this season it was always going to be difficult to 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 play week in week out. And obviously, I've not played as much as I'd like because of so many different reasons. Um, um, the, the 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 cup games when when you're called upon, um, you, you've got to be ready. You've got to be. It's your opportunity to to sort of make a make a claim. So what do you think? What do you think it was about you then with that that has been able to have really positive relationships with all your managers? You think I, it's I just, something about you or something about them? No, I think it, I think it's it's, a, it's, a, it's collective. It's about it's about having respect for for people. Like I said earlier about 
teammates. How do you get on with your teammates? You have respect for them. Um, and that's what I've always tried to do. I've always, as you know, I've always been very vocal of my feelings and, and if I feel that there can be higher standards or improvement. Um, but that's always driven me as well. That's if I'm if I'm if I'm asking for higher standards from in whatever area it may be. Why are you not in the gym or whatever? As the older you get, obviously you can you can speak to younger players and maybe say, or even even players of your own age and say, look, come on, we need you. You need, you're 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 one of the more, more experienced ones now. Come in the gym and let's start doing some sessions and, and people will follow and um, you know what it's like in times times sometimes habits fall away you might get two or three months into the season the boys have uh, we're plodding along nicely in the league or whatever and all of a sudden no one's in the gym on a Tuesday you're thinking where is everyone um, and that's down to what you'd say is the core of your squad to to prick everyone's ears a little bit and say come on like we're going to do this or the SNC coach has got a leg session let's, let's get in and um, I think it's just respect, but to answer your question in, in terms of relationships, I think it's just respect um, for your manager, for the staff, um, and and give them everything because ultimately they're there to. When 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 you've got a man, that they're with you. You're not you're not uh, you're not separate. Your manager's part of your team. Your coaches are part of your team. You all you all want one thing, and that's success. Whatever that whatever that looks like it's different at different places but ultimately everyone's pushing for the same thing success and I think uh, in any working environment you have to get on with people that you might not spend I mean I don't really pass other than my family I don't uh, I don't spend a lot of time with, with with anyone else but that's down to my my situation in terms of where, where we're living and things like that but um, I, I I get on with everyone I wouldn't say there's no one that uh, I don't get on with, and, and I, I feel like that's a strained relationship. It's not. I've never, never, never has it been. So these, I mean, you've been around enough changing rooms, um, and especially in elite environments, to to know when a player isn't necessarily understood, or might be, you know, people would always refer to, "Well, oh, he's got a bad attitude," or you, you know, and that player might feel like, oh, "I'm misunderstood." You know, those players are everywhere. What advice would you give? Because you've never had that, you know, situation. You've you've never been misunderstood. You've always been respectful. You've always asked questions. You've always been trustworthy and, and, and reliable. For these guys that are necessarily going through periods where their their attitudes being questioned or they feel like oh no one understands me or or they they're blaming everything on on a manager or, or, or trying to find an excuse elsewhere. Like what what advice would you give to them about how they can become you know I'm not just embarrassing you but more accountable a little bit like you. There's a uh, one. I don't know. One 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 thing I've learned um, over over the past few years, probably, is um, you you can't change anyone. You, you can you can maybe try and guide or um, uh, try and give advice to whether the, if they ask for it or whatever. But you'll never change anyone. So as long as um, as long as you're doing what you feel is right. Um, by them or by yourself uh, whether that be how you apply yourself in training how you apply yourself in the gym how you apply yourself around the training ground good good manners respect for everyone um, they're, they're values that the gaffer really I mean I would say as, uh, my upbringing was good and I, got, I was taught good values as, 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 as you know like you, we were all uh, from our group we were, we were all good kids um, but the biggest thing is just respect and, and those values take you so far in life. You, like you say, that you see players that blame everyone or I say players, you see people. You see people that blame someone else or it's not my fault, this happened because of that. Um, more often than not, it's because they've not looked in the mirror and said, actually, I might have been wrong in that scenario. And, and then all of a sudden you dig a bigger hole because you can't accept that you were wrong and... Um, and then in the end, in football, you know what it's like in football, in the end, you're out the door within, within minutes, and especially more so now. I mean, now, the, the, it's like, it's, not, it's not, not good for the group, out. That's how it is. Um, so, yeah, you, 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 there's no choice now. Um, but, yeah, just good values. Okay, mate, let's uh, start get to, to get to the end now. So I've got some quick, of, I call them quick fire questions, but, you know, I'll probably ask you more questions about each one. So slow fire questions. Number one. 
<laughs> what is the best piece of advice you've ever had in your career? Best piece of advice I've ever had in my career? This is really slow fire questions, but you're right. Other than you found your level. Yeah, you found your level. Um, <laughs> there's not really one, not one piece. There's not one piece of advice really that I can that I can pinpoint and say it was that. You know? Yeah. Maybe come back to it. I'll, I'll think. <laughs> All right, no problem. Um, what, in your opinion, was your best performance ever? You remember it? Best performance ever. It certainly wasn't the Johnson Paint Trophy for Swindon at Wembley. That was a shambles. What a big day passed and it all went to pot. Never like got how, a like how, I mean, go on in. How, how do you approach such a big day like that? And Because um, I haven't got down here, what was your worst performance? But how, how, it's a cup final, massive when, day. If you had said worst <laughs> performance, that's straight <laughs> in the, the top pressure. of my head. Like what, what ends up happening there then, do you reckon, for, for that to happen? Well, it, it was like, I was at Swindon in the JTP final which was obviously for Swindon it was like massive Wembley first time I'd ever been to Wembley or played at Wembley and um, I was just a marked man on the day and I just couldn't get a yard I can't who remember did you who. play against? Uh, it was I think it was Colchester um, Colchester yeah but I just couldn't get a yard like every time I got a kick the fullback just it was there and I just I would go deeper and deeper and I remember having a, I think it was about 75 minutes, I got a free kick, 25 yards out, and you know what it's like when it's going wrong. <laughs> Whistled one, it's gone like 40 yards over the bars. Like, it sums me up today. Um, but I suppose it was a learning curve. It was like the emotion, the feeling going into the game. Um, yeah, I remember it. it was such a big build up because it was we were at Swindon at the time. It was like for us, it was like you may never get an opportunity yeah. again. Yeah, um, that was just rubbish. Absolutely. So flip it then. What what was your best performance? My best performance. There's been a few, but the one that sticks out in your memory. Yeah, there's a couple. A couple at Bournemouth of that moments. Probably not performance, but moments. Chess volley. Uh, yeah, first Premier League goal for Bournemouth. Chess volley. That was a fantastic moment. Um, another one was Bolton when we got promoted. Um, Yanni chested it for me. So me up, passed it into the corner. Yeah, passed it in the corner. That was that was like such relief, you know. Um, and then we played at Newcastle. We played Tottenham at home, and I actually got taken off in the game, uh, but probably got to seventy minutes. Um, but I remember playing and thinking, I'm playing against Tottenham here, and I felt like I was. I felt like I, if anything was happening, I was. I was, uh, it was coming, it was coming down my side of the pitch, and it gave me so much confidence. I watched the, I watched most of the games back that that I played in, and I watched it back, and there, there was, I took a lot of confidence from that. And even in, even in uh, later on, two, three years later, if I was ever going through a tough period and not creating enough or not getting in the spaces that I maybe could have done, I would always go back to some clips from that game and. and um, Josselu scored ahead of that game, uh, cr- across from from the from the right hand side, my left foot, and uh, that that's like a memory of Newcastle. That I think that was a that was a good game, you know.